You're live. Awesome. Unfortunately, you can't see me. All right, well, the, the ghost of Museo, also named Katie Adams Farrell, is speaking to you from behind the red box, which is very exciting for everyone, I'm sure. So thanks everyone for joining us this evening. We have a wonderful, this is our first artist talk in a series of uh, new programs that we're launching at Museo called Third Thursdays. So thanks for hopping on with us today and for bearing with our um, super fun technical technological difficulties. Um, we are really, really excited to have William Camargo for this final program of um, his exhibition programming, Origins and Displacements. As you know, Museo has volume two. And I'm gonna go ahead and kick it right over to William to introduce our panelists and also to um, tell us a little bit more about um, Origins and Displacements. So take it away, William. Oh, awesome. Uh, thanks for everyone uh, that's attending and as well the folks on Facebook Live. Um, so I'm William Camargo. I'm an artist. I'm an advocate. Uh, I'm also an educator. Um, and I would call myself more of a community archivist. Right? I don't have any uh, professional or institutional training to be an, an archivist, uh, but I collect archives from neighborhoods from uh, the Latinx diaspora as well. Um, and here we also have uh, Jesus Cortez. Uh, I'm going to read you just a quick bio on Jesus Cortez. Uh, he is an undocumented immigrant writer who resides in West Anaheim, California. Right? Uh, he writes from the perspective of a man raised by his single mother. Through his writing, he attempts to bring the stories rarely told about Anaheim and the people in it. Um, and then we have Maritza Geronimo, uh, who is a Nahua Quechua Chicana from Anaheim. There are a doctorate student in the ge geography department at UCLA uh, that research and critical community engagement with indigenous food sovereignty, explore the relationship of space, food, and health for indigenous migrants. They organize with the Eagle and, and the Condor Liberation Front, co-facilitating food sovereignty projects. Uh, so uh, I'd like to, everyone to welcome them here on uh, Museo, on the digital space, in the Zoom world, in the Facebook Live world. Um, and in the, in the cloud as well, because I guess this is being recorded. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna share my screen a little bit just to give you a little bit of background of how my project origins and displacements came about. Uh, a little bit of my process too. Um, in the other talks I've done, I haven't shown uh, the archive images that I actually was, uh, that I found through my research, through coming back from living away, um, and, and really embracing uh, the history that wasn't really told about Anaheim growing up. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna share my age, but I'm a little old. But, you know, I wanna throw out a shout out to uh, public schools in Anaheim. Uh, I went to Horace Mann Elementary, uh, Sycamore Junior High or Sycamore, what they call it. And then finding the Anaheim High School. I'm also a, uh, a product of community college, uh, Cal State Fullerton and as well as a, a private school, Claremont Graduate University. Um, let me able to do this um, and share my screen. Wait, hold on. There we go. Um, so if folks, uh, panelists, can you see that? Cool. Um, I'm gonna be sharing just quickly because I do definitely wanna uh, um, hand over some more time to our guest panelists. Um, you know, this show was started out of my uh, graduate uh, thesis show, which was, uh, you know, I wanted to definitely get in more and learn about, a little bit more about my hometown. Um, as we know, Anaheim is in Tongva land, and I think definitely we want to acknowledge uh, the keepers of this land uh, before the migration of, of, you know, a lot of Mexicanos uh, and other Latinx folks um, in Anaheim as well. Um, and so, you know, I, I tell this just kind of like a history placed front and center uh, because it's usually uh, on the side or it's, it's um, kind of placed in, in, in otherness uh, in which we see a lot of in, in 
institutions uh, who, who has knowledge, who validates knowledge. Um, and that's what sometimes we're against, up against a lot of, of the folks in this panel as well. Um, and while, while doing research, I, I definitely, uh, you know, went to this place called the Heritage Center in Anaheim, the Anaheim Heritage Center, uh, which had a, a, a quite a bit of amount of, of archives that I, I was totally surprised to see. Um, you know, I, I wasn't really, I, I knew about the Orange Groves, I knew about uh, the predominantly Latinx community in Anaheim now, uh, but what came before wasn't really uh, something that I, I heard about or uh, talked about or uh, some of the findings that I did find were through uh, the alternative weekly newspaper uh, named OC Weekly, which is uh, selling out the funk, right? Um, you know, this is where, where I was grabbing some of the history uh, and then I further investigated. Um, so this image is, is uh, Native American workers in Anaheim uh, in the 1920s. Um, you know, photography was also a, a new te uh, technology. Um, and I think, you know, as we can tell here, this, it's an old photograph and, uh, you know, sometimes when people pose for photographs in the 1920s, uh, they literally had to sit there or stand there for uh, more than 10 minutes sometimes. Um, you know, so I would just gravitate to all these archives that I was finding you know, of brown folks in, uh, in Anaheim. Uh, he's another one of uh, one of the earlier uh, neighborhoods in, in the Mexican neighborhoods in Anaheim called La, La Fabrica, uh, which is, um, it's still, it's still there, right? It's on uh, La Palma and Olive around there, that little area. Uh, there's still some, fab, uh, some warehouse or some uh, fabricas uh, where a lot of uh, folks migrated to and, and got jobs there, right? Um, so this is this neighborhood, which, um, you know, still has a, a rich history that really isn't told. The next one. Uh, not too far from that is also, uh, which is not up there anymore. It's, it's called, uh, it was called the La Palma School in Anaheim uh, in around 1941. This is a, a class picture. Um, and it was, it was purposely made uh, for uh, Mexicanos, right? It was a Mexican school, it was an all brown Mexican school. Uh, very much uh, segregated. Um, um, and we you know before making this school, I, I saw this uh, clip from the Anaheim Bulletin. Uh, once, you know, they needed to make the school for Mexicanos. Um, and, and the headline just catched my eyes as well. It says, Mexicans must bathe is Eric of Anaheim Board of Education, right? Um, so, you know, what, what they thought of Mexicanos uh, in the 20s, uh, it wasn't surprising. And I think we have to really kind of talk about some of these histories because um, the histories that we're living today, the present are very much always interconnected, at least for me and at least for the, the work that I've, I've done and, and just the histories that I've, I've seen uh, play out in the city of Anaheim. Um, you know, so they thought Mexicanos didn't shower. Uh, you know, this school had, it says, you know, each will contain bathing facilities as it is the plan of the school board to compel the 150 Mexican pupils to take baths regularly, um, the same as American pupils, you're right? So they, they definitely say like, you know, what's the standard, right? It's these American kids. Um, uh, I mean, kids today, I think we're kids. Uh, I smelled when I was a kid. <laughs> And the same thing with my like white friend or my Asian friend, <laughs> we all smell, we were just, um, so, you know, this is creating these stereotypes already. And I think they definitely affect how uh, a population, uh, especially black, indigenous, uh, queer, uh, brown folks are, are seen today and have these kind of concepts that are, are usually get passed down. Um, um, and, you know, the, the some of these images in, in both the shows at Museo and Grand Central are, are part of the same show. Uh, and these are kind of, um, you know, my responses to, uh, and my insertion in these spaces that are, are definitely these kind of negotiations with history, um, these counter narratives as well. So this is, uh, and I also like to use language that I was using, that I still use, right? There's, there's this form of code switching when um, you know, I have a, a bachelor's and I have a master's degree. Um, code switching is a, is a kind of 
survival uh, method that we use in, in academia is uh, we're not going to cuss, we're not going to use the, the language in, in the hood that we used to use. Uh, but I think I also want to bring that in and, and kind of think about language as, that, as a form of resistance as well. Uh, so this is called, um, you know, it's from the Citrus War in 1936. Uh, I didn't want to include like a lot of the archives. I just want to do a little brief kind of introduction of, of the work and the, you know, where do I get that inspiration from? Um, so this is called Damn Yawa Valley in 1936. Um, uh, again, the OC Weekly archives are still up online. You can definitely check out like a bigger article um, on this, on, on the Citrus War. Um, and, and this one doesn't have a date because uh, you know, what I'm thinking is now uh, who's being affected by, by gentrification, right? Uh, who was moved into those, um, into near the orange groves, who, who uh, you know, the city built these little neighborhoods purposely to kind of, right, keep uh, people of color, black folks uh, separately from, uh, from the, you know, the, the white population here. So I think, uh, you know, we're seeing this kind of a circulation of, of histories, um, you know, who, what is being affected by gentrification now, right? Uh, especially somewhere in Anaheim and Santana, um, you know, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, this is why history is so important. And I think we shouldn't go just and, and forget about the history, uh, especially a history that wasn't really told to the, uh, to the youth in Anaheim. And this one's also at, um, at Grand Central in Santana. Um, and this is another one uh, uh, that, you know, we did put up on, on the Museo Instagram, uh, but it definitely, it kind of convinced me of this connecting this to history because, uh, you know, it, it, it enabled a lot of uh, contemporary history that, that we saw, um, you know, not too long ago, right, um, in 2016. Right, how we, how was this able to occur? Um, and, you know, I always see connections with this um, and that, uh, and, and it wasn't a huge surprise to me, right? It wasn't uh, something that I, I was saying, oh, the city's gonna be able to um, stop this, right? You know, and, and they're run almost, you know, almost a hundred years apart. Uh, but if, if we don't talk about this, uh, then a lot of these things are gonna happen again. Um, you know, that's this perspective that I have and that's perspective that, that we see in history, um, right? And, and coincidentally, uh, this happened uh, near a, uh, a segregated park, uh, uh, which is called now uh, Precinct Park. Uh, and, you know, it's a place where I have, um, you know, I used to play soccer, I used to practice soccer. Um, and I, we like, you know, with the thing with histories and, and kind of hidden histories, um, it, the histories that I did find out about this was through uh, some oral histories kept at CSUF through, um, you know, an Anaheim resident uh, uh, from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and stated that there was a, a particular area of the park you, that um, Mexicanos couldn't, couldn't, you know, hang out, right? Um, I'm not sure which side of the park it was. Uh, so, you know, my insertion is I've definitely been to probably the side that uh, wouldn't allow Mexicanos back in the day, uh, you know, to hang out, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the connection with that is, is um, it's, uh, it's pretty vivid and, and uncanny as well. Um, let me go to the next one. Um, you know, one thing that too that, that we forget, I think, is um, is these spaces that that um, the city usually tries to kind of bring in some tourism, right? We we know uh, Anaheim is a huge uh, tourist city, um, and again, it's just kind of this uh, current the the continuation of whitewashing. Um, you know, the, the city landmarks that that we have. Um, I don't really go to this uh, um, place. Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, maybe there's people that go and, and buy expensive stuff or 
I know it's it just this this can this connectedness that I have with this space now. Um, and when I did put this this image up on Instagram, etc., and and um, currently it's up at uh, Self Help Graphics, I had people told me that their grandma, that their mother, uh, and their fathers like you know picked oranges, packed them in this place, um, and so you know these histories kind of start coming in because um, you know it it feels great to have people connect to it and realize that that they're part of this history that you know, they just never really talked about um, beforehand. Um, I think that's it. I'm gonna stop there. Um, and and now I'm gonna uh, hand the floor to uh, Jesus Cortez, um, who's gonna be reading and talking about uh, his poetry. Uh, one of the main purposes of this thing is I also wanted to give an, a platform to other folks in Anaheim uh, who've been doing amazing work um, and so, Take it away, Jesus. Okay, so I'm gonna be reading from my chapbook, which was published by Libro Mobile. Um, so uh, just to, just to uh, go off from what William was talking about, right? The whole, how, how the city, how, how a lot of this, the history of the city gets, uh, gets whitewashed or, or hidden or, or, or just ignored, right? Uh, and and we all know why. I mean, we all know it has everything to do with the with the mouse house, and uh, and like growing up, a lot of people like that I would meet, like when I would tell them, "Oh, I'm from Anaheim," like the assumption is always, "Oh, Disneyland," and you know, I gotta I gotta let them know that that is it's not like that, you know. Especially like like for uh, us that grew up on 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 the west part of town, like we're far far from Disneyland and. And even even uh, until not not up until recently, right? W was there a, a lot of uh, more more uh, development, right? Because even growing up, I remember we used to have a lot of empty lots, you know. Like, and I'm okay with that, but but I guess uh, instead of building uh, affordable housing, they decided to build luxury condos, you know. So you got luxury condos across the street from from. Uh, from, from hotels and motels where, where poor people live, right? Uh, black, brown, and, and white, you know? So just, so just a little, you know, personal history, I guess, from, from where I'm from. Uh, and and I, I guess I'll share too from what, what schools I went to, which were a lot growing up. Uh, but shout out to everyone that went to Maxwell Elementary and, and Danbrook Elementary, uh, especially, because that's, that's where I ended up getting out of sixth grade and, and Orange View and Dale Junior High and, and Magnolia and, and so on and so forth. But, but I got a family that went to, to Western and, and Savannah and Brookers, you know, so shout out to everyone. Um, and those schools are mostly uh, out here in, in West Anaheim. Right? So uh, that's, that's, that's where I come from. So the, I'm gonna start reading. Uh, about you know my experiences and and this is more like in the 90s right because i think a lot of us know that in in the 90s it, it was a very violent time everywhere um but in, in anaheim it wasn't any different right uh like, like i was saying earlier like in the news like, like the news media always tries to like ignore it or cover it up you know and and, and a lot of people get the the, the impression that that it's all good here and, and it wasn't, you know, so. So I'm gonna read one, it's called 1995 in West Anaheim. Uh, here we go. When you grow up in the city, you get used to justified homicide. They said the streets would swallow your soul. A life lived fast is better than waiting to live. Time went by quick when you stepped out into the streets. Your feet moved faster trying to live another second. You avoided the drugs that killed many brains. Alcohol was your poison. Life was slipping away. Nobody seemed to care. Someone tried to save your soul with the gospel. Others tried, tried to kill it with their school books. Your heart died before manhood bloomed. Nothing mattered. As long as you carry your knife in an empty pocket, you can take their life before they could take your soul. Uh, so, uh, 
It's just, uh, it, it was, it's a reality, right? That, that a lot of young people live. Um, and in 1995, I was 15, so I'm, I'm a lot older than even than even William. Uh, but again, you know, uh, so that's that was my experience, and a lot of other people's experiences even now, right? Like like a lot of the youth, like like the, their needs are not being met. You know, there's more focus on on investing in in, uh, in luxury condos or or whatever you know near the Platinum Triangle or or the Disneyland Resort, but but there's not a lot of resources for the youth. You know, even when they built the, the community center here in West Anaheim, they built it right next door to a police station. And, and I don't know how trusting people and, and families are of police stations, especially after 2012. So, you know, but that's, that's how it is. Uh, so I'm gonna read another one. Uh, it's about a, a donut shop that I used to go to a lot. And before it was a donut shop, it, it was an arcade right there on, on Beach and Orange. And that was the, what, the first time I did chill in junior high. That's where I ended up at. Uh, but yeah, but now it's a donut shop. Then, and the way things are on, on Beach Boulevard, I don't, who knows what's, what's gonna, what it's going to be next, right? But it's called BNB. <clears throat> it welcomes you as the night crumbles on the city. You walk inside, order coffee, and sit. You admire the sights and take in the smells, decay, loneliness. You become part of those who were swallowed by the unforgiving streets. They walk in with their pretty shoes and their pretty tight clothes and their tired legs and their tired eyes. They walk in with their dirty shoes and their dirty clothes, dragging their souls on cracked concrete of a city that lo slowly kills you all. Uh, you know, and I and I read that uh, I wrote that uh, to, to honor, you know, all the the all the people on the streets. You know, uh, again, people ignored by by city hall. You know, because when they when they talk about fixing Beach Boulevard or or any part in in the city, it, it, it's never to benefit. It's never to benefit us, right? Like the people that need it the most. So, yeah, so um, the next one I'm going to read, uh, it's, it's, it's also about people on the streets. Because uh, again, you know, uh, it's, that's, that's where I'm from too. So it's called the Queens and Kings. Never listen when they tell you the city ain't yours. You walk between the concrete selling paradise to the desperate and impure. When you walk the streets with your stilettos, remember you're the queen and you, don't, and you don't need no crown of thorns, queen of all streets. Never listen when they tell you the city ain't yours. When you stand your ground on corners that others speared across, your body carries the thorns of yesterday's, your eyes the fire of today, when they walk by you with disdain, show them your blood staining the concrete. Show them your wounds. They have never bled and sacrificed for your city as you have done, street corner king. So this next one uh, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna share it. It's, uh, it's about my favorite park in the city and uh, Toilet Reed Park. I think anyone in, in West Anaheim that, that grew up here knows about Toilet Reed Park. Uh, and even in, in that park, is it, it has a very interesting history, right? Because I think a lot of us growing up, that's that's where we ended up at. And uh, be, I guess because of what, what what the world was and what Anaheim was in the 90s, now it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the parks that's most mo mostly uh, heavily surveyed, so, un under surveillance. So there's cameras all over the park, like giant, like giant cameras, and uh, and I mean it's not the park I grew up in, but it's it's still close to my heart. So uh, here it goes. It's Twilight Reed Park. My knees shook as I approached her near the playground. We looked eye to eye, but the right words never left my heart. She was so pretty, and I felt too broken to speak my true feelings. 
love lost before she knew it even existed. The blades of grass, the open arms receive my blood sacrifice. The last of what my little, what little innocence was left in my 13 year old body. The blows to my face were the violent city. The alcohol that entered my veins was baptism water. I let the innocent boy die and arose a dead man. Um, so this, this next one, uh, I'm gonna read. Uh, I've shared it plenty of times uh, and it's, I dedicated it to, to the, you know, to the people that have died at the hands of the police um, who still have not received any justice. Uh, it's called Anaheim Monuments. And here it goes. There is a statue near the homeless camps among the bodies of men and women who had become like the grass at La Palma Park, surrounded by a fence to keep the new neighbors from leaving and their dogs from escaping stands the monu monument to Bruno the dog. Hero to the badges and martyr for the cause of all lives matter. Proud stands Bruno as proud as the Statue of Liberty and false promises. A few blocks away remain monuments for the martyrs of a city in denial. Sometimes you wish you were a dog so your life could matter. Uh, I'm gonna read just one more. Uh, this is the last one uh, in, in and, and I, I share this one and I dedicate it to, to my mom who, who passed away uh, four years ago and, and all the Anaheim mothers right, who have to, to raise kids out here and, and, and especially through the 90s. Um, so here it goes. It's to an Anaheim mother. You cried for my lost soul taken by Anaheim streets, Lincoln Avenue, Bella Vista, Pacific Street, and many more apartments where privacy was a luxury that I searched for in alleys and dark nights. We cried together as promises were made, then forgotten as the alcohol reached my 13 year old belly and then the handcuffs. You cried and asked why. I cried because the answer was bigger than our pain. This American dream that you wanted to give me, you stayed up late praying for me to remember while you crossed the border while you tolerated all the scars, while your mind paid the price. We are broken now, you and I. You were more than that scarred body and mind. We were more than mother and son. We were heart and soul. Yet tears fill up my eyes and my feet forget to move. The city will remind me to see you in every street where you dragged your bones, never stopping, always loving. That's it. Cool. Thank you, Jesus. Um, yeah, amazing words. Uh, I mean, definitely. Um, you know, we could we could probably chat about it afterwards and and uh, share some stories. Um, uh, now, I think uh, Katie, if you want to um, bring up uh, Maritza's, uh, Maritza will be sharing a great project uh, that connected all of us. Uh, uh, so here we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesus, too, for that poetry. Um, it's very grounding, um, especially because I'm away from Anaheim, but all of, all of your poetry just brings me back there. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really, you know, happy to be here with y'all today. Thank you, Will, for inviting me to um, shout out to my my Anaheim schools too, I guess. Uh, you know, I I was raised right there by Loera Elementary, actually. Um, so I went there, Ball Junior High, um, and graduated from Loera High School. Um, so I also worked for a time at Magnolia High School, Catella High School. So I've been a different schools and you know it, it's been really a blessing to work with with students from Anaheim because like y'all mentioned right I think we get overlooked a lot especially K through 12 um, you know police there every day after school waiting watching our, our, our youth 
Um, so it was it was a honor really to work at the schools and, and try to challenge some of that. So I'm really grateful to Anaheim. Um, and so this presentation is is about the Guerrerense diaspora zine that I um, put together with a couple other friends um, who I met along the way uh, throughout this process. And essentially, I'll be sharing a little bit of the images of the zine um, and the inspiration of what, what um, came to be this zine. So yeah, if you wanna go to the next slide. So this is Guerrero, um, very far from Anaheim, but not too far really, because there's so many of us um, out here in Anaheim, including Will and Jesus, who are both in the zine. And you know, I wanted to show these maps because I think a lot of people, one, don't know where Guerrero is. Um, and it's in the Southern part of Mexico. And so these two maps I chose because for me, Guerrero is really a, a place of, of resistance, of rebellion. And this on the one map is showing like the different indigenous groups that we have there, including the Amusco, Mixteco, Nahua, and Tlapaneco. Um, and then this map is not complete. I, I feel like any, any map that's coming from the state is, is very skewed. Um, so, you know, there's indigenous people all over Guerrero, um, but this one in particular, I think, showed just the dominant places where, where different indigenous pueblos are. Um, and the map on, I'm not sure what side it is for you all, but on my right is, is this Afro-Mexican um, map that was made in, after the first census, where it included Afro-Mexicans. So in the very bottom, you can see like just how yellow and green um, the regions of Guerrero and also Oaxaca are because of the Costa Chica, um, which is where a lot of Afro-Mexican, Afro-Indigenous communities are. And so for me, um, this zine was really a space to highlight um, those experiences, right, of indigenous peoples, of Afro-indigenous people. Um, and so, I mean, I, I felt like there was stories to be told, uh, connections to be made across um, the regions, right, of Guerrero. And um, initially was just gonna focus on Orange County because I had just grown up seeing so many Guerrerenses um, around me for, in Anaheim and Santana and I ended up actually making it broader to include Guerrerenses in diaspora more generally, because there were so many folks from Chicago, from um, Oxnard, from the Bay who, who wanted to participate. And so essentially I put out the call for submissions in February of this year, and it took a minute to, to gather everything. So, um, it, it was a definitely a long process because of, of the pandemic that kind of emerged in the middle of, of organizing the zine. Um, and it was my first time putting together something that was with people that I, I, I didn't really know. It was just an open call. And I think part of it was also to make, make those connections with other um, folks from the diaspora. So yeah, if you can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so this is just a quick picture of the top is Huitzuco Guerrero, which is where my mom is from. And it's a, I mean, I've never been there. I, I think this is, you know, something I hope to do in my lifetime, um, but it's a beautiful place in between the mountains. And I, I know that I'll talk a little about this a little bit more later, but she, she migrated here in the early 1990s um, just due to economic reasons um, and landed here in Anaheim, which is a very different geography. Um, I just always like seeing these images because, um, you know, we come from a lot of lands that are, you know, farm working lands where we get to subsist off our own foods and 
that was really important to my family. Um, and, and, you know, that really changed when we came to Anaheim. Um, it was very different over here. So yeah, this is, I'll talk a little bit more about this, I think later, but I wanted to just share personally to um, my roots in Guerrero. And so in August, we finally published digitally the Guerrerense Diaspora Zine, the first uh, volume. Um, and it has, I think, I wrote it down, has 13 contributors with, like I mentioned, folks from LA, Oxnard, Chicago, the Bay Area, Anaheim, Santana, and even Washington. So there, the, there was a bunch of interest, I think, originally. And then, you know, a lot of folks ended up submitting. And so right now we're in the process of announcing a second volume, another call for submissions, because there was a lot of folks who wanted to, to you know, be part of these conversations and be highlighted because Guerrero gets overlooked a lot. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that. But I wanna share some of the images now. Um, and we start the zine with a brief history of Guerrero, right? One of my really good friends, Joel um, Calisto, wrote a brief history of the regions of Guerrero and tried to highlight the fact that we are a lot more than violence. Um, I think Guerrero in the dominant media gets painted as just um, ongoing narco violence, state violence. And while this is a reality of our peoples, we are so much more than that too. Um, and so part of the zine was showing both the, the realities that we're facing in Guerrero and you know honoring the fact that um, we come from this place while also showing that we are creating um, just new, uh, places belonging in diaspora as well. And, you know, this was my submission for the zine, um, which was to honor the 43 missing students of Ayotzinapa um, who were murdered, who were, some of them were murdered by the state and others are missing until this day. Um, and this is a particularly important um, cause for me uh, being in conversation with a lot of the mothers um, and parents of Ayotzinapa over the years, um, they have never stopped searching and they're still seeking justice. And it was important, I think, for a lot of folks, even in diaspora, I remember going to a lot of the, of the marches and vigils in Santana when, when this happened. So it was important, I think, for me to, to put something in there. And yeah, so this is how we start the zine. And then we, we have a bunch of different contributions, a lot of poetry, a lot of um, just stories of people's families and pictures. But another thing that was really important in the zine was the idea of food. And so a really good friend of mine that I made along the way, um, Angeles from Santana actually, um, included some of their family recipes from the, from the Costa Chica. So this is a recipe that's in the zine, um, Anchilate, and it's a really important, um, it's a really important recipe, right, with indigenous and Afro-indigenous roots. And that was like probably one of the biggest things we wanted to highlight in the zine. And I was really happy that Angelis was willing to share this recipe. So it's in there if y'all wanna, you know, make chilate here. Um, it's a really great and easy recipe. And this is another recipe that um, my mom and my sister created together. Um, I had asked my mom to submit and, you know, she, I, I think one of the ways that she shows a lot of her love and care for us has always been through food. Um, and one of the ways that she's continued to share stories um, with us. So she, she wrote here that these are some of the enchiladas that she used to sell in Guerrero with her mom. And so she, 
she gives you all the steps. So if you want to make these two, they're in there. But it was a really great way for, I think, my my sister to also get involved, who's um, who's kind of in this process of also learning more about our family and our roots. And yeah, so it's a really special intergenerational part of the zine. And lastly, I just wanted to share this image that my friend Angeles also made, right? Um, no hay guerrero sin los pueblos negros. There is no guerrero without black communities. And this was important for us to mention just because of the fact that um, in Mexico, till this day, indigenous and black communities get um, are at the are the ones facing just ongoing state state violence and are often overlooked. Um, and they're at least black communities in Guerrero are one of the biggest communities there who have contributed and continue to to be present till this day. Even here in Santana, we have one of the biggest populations of Afro Indígenas. So I was really happy that we got to include this. And in the zine, you'll see a lot more of the just like statistics and the ongoing struggles that Afro Mexicanos are facing. Um, so yeah, this is just a little bit of the zine. There's, I think, 60 pages of different works. Um, and yeah, thank you all for 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 listening um please keep following us on instagram um we have a really big announcement coming up in january so i'm really excited for for what's to come and yeah thank you cool thank you marita and uh thank you jesus um yeah so you know we'll, we'll chat here a couple minutes um feel free to uh, add questions on the on the Q and A and on the Facebook if if you're watching from there. Um, uh, Katie will will try to um, uh, send us those questions. Uh, but you know, one of the things that I wanted to um, kind of throw out there and and see, uh, you know, how personally these uh, stories, these migrant stories, are are for us. Um, you know, obviously for me, I you know I was born here and and um, I did travel to to get it a lot. Um, and, and, you know, both my parents are, are from Guerrero and, you know, our history is also in, in Guerrero, we're raised, you know, my indigenous history is also kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm still discovering, you know, where my family's from, where uh, those roots are, um, and, and so forth on. So, you know, I just one question for both of you is, is, you know, how, how, how did both of y'all kind of end up here in Anaheim and, and now making the work. I want to go for it. He's the one to answer. I got my my answer is long, so like very long. So. Oh, okay, go for it. Yes, okay. Well, so my mom is the one from Guerrero, right? And and she arrived to Puebla when she was like three years old, and and that's where I was born. But but me and my mom, we always joked around that Puro Guerrero, you know. So yeah. I was I was born in Puebla, but then like when I was nine, uh, we came here. Well my mom left, first she came. And then I, I traveled here with, with my sister who was 16 at the time, and my nephew who was a year old. Uh, and I was nine. And uh, you know, we, we took the, the three the three day bus ride to, to TJ and and magically crossed the border <laughs> and yeah that was it and uh and i remember we arrived in la and and i was tripping out because you know i mean in, in in mexico you don't hear anything you just hear you hear california and you hear la right because all the movies and all the all the tv shows so i remember we were driving uh we were driving off and and I was like, and, and the buildings kept getting smaller. And, and I was like, what the, where are we going? <laughs> you know, I thought we were here. And, uh, and yeah, it was, a, it was this trip. Because then, then I remember we, we arrived uh, right there at the corner of Brookers and Lincoln. And, and if you're from Anaheim, you know the, the big old Limbrook bowling, the bowling alley. 
you know so that was the one of the first things that i saw as a kid you know and 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 you know and that's 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 it 1989 and yeah 30 31 years here so yeah so anaheim for real you know that's it. and that was the year i was born man <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right, right right when i was out bro <laughs> <laughs> Limburg is in a, I mean, hopefully it survives, bro, because I, you know, that's a spot that, um, um, you know, stay in school, but, you know, that when I did, I, I was getting <laughs> Limburg. It was fun, you know, just bowling and, uh, you know, it was a very, I love like these like little spots in Anaheim that all of us have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Maritza, do you want to go ahead and? Yeah. So um, I was, actually born in LA, in <laughs> Chinatown, LA. Um, that's where my mom first arrived um, when she migrated here from Guerrero. And we somehow ended up back in Anaheim, like right, like soon after. Um, so I was raised in Anaheim and, and I consider it definitely my home, right? Um, and for most of our upbringing here, you know, most of my mom's pueblo is in Anaheim like there was just I remember growing up and being in community where we would have folks that could migrate back um, because most of us could not um, and they would bring like queso they will bring like semillitas they will bring on um, guajes they will bring everything and we would just gather at, at these folks homes and get to share space and stories um, so it was Really, like for me, even though Anaheim was so big, um, just knowing that we had all these people that were there that were like familia, it felt really small and special. Um, and we had all these networks of people too, like, you know, growing up uh, with my mom as a single mother, like it was rough in Anaheim, especially like as prices started getting, you know, higher for rent. Um, but we had like always these Guerrero connections with folks working at like Pizza Hut. That's one of my memories that I still have. Like they would bring the Pizza Hut when we didn't have food and they would just like drop it off. Like, cause there was, you know, always extras at the end of the work day. So it, it's always been just like all those connections and networks that we make for ourselves here. Um, so yeah, it's Anaheim is, is it for me. <laughs> cool. Now that's funny. Cause I, every time, uh... I mean, I always like talk about pizza because I grew up right near one. <laughs> That's the one that I used to go instead of, you know, later on it was like Little Caesars because it was like five bucks, you know, but um, you always need someone at Pizza Hut. The one right there in La Palma, especially for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, I was I was born like at, in a hospital in, in Santana, uh, but that was just, you know, my family was already living in Anaheim uh, by then. Um, and you know, not until not until older, like you know, when I, when I was older, my my mother told me these stories of of her crossing, um, and actually, you know, getting um, violently dragged by uh, by police by border patrol, uh, and it just astounded me how like nonchalant she talked about it because she's like, well, I'm just gonna try the next day, whatever, uh, and that kind of resilience of 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 you know of folks um, migrating here. Um, <laughs> And, you know, the stories that my dad, like now he's, you know, sadly too, just we see the like, um, you know, we had like at least 25 like members of our family like live within the same apartment complex or like across the street. Um, and it's it's been so, it's been so kind of sad to see like com tech knit communities kind of like, right, go away because of these prices. Um, you know, now there's only like, I think we only have um, like three other family members that live nearby. Um, and, you know, when I came back here from from being away from living in Chicago, where, you know, it's funny because when I did go over there, like I have a couple videos on my phone about like when I, you know, I was in a room with like five, six of the Guerrerenses and we're just like, whoa, that's crazy, you know. Um, you know, that attachment to to that state and, and their stories were also so like familiar, but also, um, 
you know, so telling about about that that state, um, and you know the the kind of you know their beginnings and how they migrated as well. Um, I think one one last thing I want to hear. There was no questions. Is, is you know I think for me there's there's been a lot of events and a lot of um, you know things that have happened in Anaheim that kind of have been. Um, you know, have changed the the way people think about the city. Um, you know, and I think you know, you know, we we shouldn't forget about about you know what happened in twenty twelve. Um, you know, we have all like you know different recollections about it. Uh, you know, I I I it's it's nearby. You know, where the shootings happened, it's nearby Sycamore where I went, and you know, I had a lot of friends going. Um, in Anna Drive and and hanging out there beforehand and um, you know briefly briefly knowing Manuel Diaz and 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 I think you know realizing that you know this was something that connected a lot of our communities together, um, but also you know trying to figure out what you know what we can do to kind of have a you know better. Um, you know, a better future for, for the youth. Cause I think, um, you know, that's something that I'm always worried about. Um, um, and, you know, I'm an educator and I, and I teach at the high schools and I do workshops with the, with the students. And, uh, you know, that was always an event that kind of, um, that I still think about over and over again and, and, you know, what is left there and, and how we should not forget, you know, what, what has happened and, and sadly what, you know, still keeps happening. Um, maybe can can some of you maybe recollect about you know I was you know I was doing an internship in Chicago when I when I found out about that and and you know I had friends texting me and and you know it was it was chaotic and it was uh, but it was something not, not nothing too surprising for at least the you know the homies that that knew this was going to happen like growing up here um, you know as well you know police would come around my neighborhood and 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 asked about my cousins who, you know, who, who were older than I was and, and, you know, mostly in the streets and, um, you know, and then I remember my cousin telling, telling me and my brother and my siblings about like, hey, yo, like, you know, we got your back, you know, we'll protect you. Um, you know, sometimes it was, it was uh, sad to be like, like, we don't have a future. They would tell me, you know, the city the situation has has pushed pushed us in, into this this kind of way of life and you know they'd be like you guys are nerds keep going <laughs> like just keep studying like you know and you know i owe a lot to to that family to my cousins who um you know some of them are still incarcerated and and i think um you know we always i'm always thinking about them as as a way to to kind of still be resistant but yeah if you want to kind of just give a little uh short, you know, where were you, well, you know, what, what happened afterwards? I guess I can go, um, yeah, I, I remember that day really well, actually. Um, I was, I think, in high school. Um, yeah, I was in high school and just, I remember already like before school was even done, people were already talking about like going down there to, to downtown and that they were gonna, everyone was gonna go. Um, and it was really interesting because at the time, even though I don't think I fully understood like the way I do now, like <laughs> of what the police is and, and the harm they do to our communities, like I just knew like that they were not the, the people to go to. That's just something I knew growing up all the time. Like we, you know, we had other ways to solve things than call the police um, because of, of, of things like that, um, that happened in our communities. But when, when 2012 happened and specifically the responses that happened, um, I remember going to downtown, but um, at the same time, my mom being so scared that, that anything would happen to me, right? So. I wasn't there for for long at all, actually. Um, you know, they they called it 
they called it a riot. And I remember that on the news all night, just calling the news people calling it a riot. And I was, I mean, at, now I can reflect on it and be like, that's, you know, it was a, it was a rebellion. It's always a rebellion because that's an ongoing thing that's been happening in our communities for way too long. And I think because of Disneyland, people forget that that happened way too quickly. Um, and so even though in Anaheim itself, like I felt like that was a really big shift in my life and understanding like even later when I worked at the high schools, um, that this was something that students still talked about, that they still were scared about, right? And um, that nothing really changed after that because like I mentioned, right? Like there were still cop cars after school with these youth who were like, they're doing nothing. They're working like three jobs to take care of their family. They're, you know, they're always, um, staying at the at the after school program so that they don't have to interfere with the with the police um and so it was just i think it's still upsetting that not a lot has changed since then um and there's been a lot of organizing of course uh to stop things like gang injunctions um and i remember just like a lot of the organizing that took place after the fact um but yeah, I mean, still to this day, it just a moment that really affected, I think, how I viewed Anaheim and the the fact that I knew that people were not gonna remember this outside of those who were there, who were affected and who who live in Anaheim, right? Because this these tourists come and go, but they don't know like the realities. So yeah, that's what I remember of that of that day. Well, so for me, it's uh, I, although obviously I didn't I didn't know them personally, but uh, it started even even before Manuel Diaz, right, in March with Martin Hernandez, uh, who was shot and killed too, and but even even before that, right, I I think growing up and and looking the way I do, because I mean I look older now, obviously, but but I've always looked like this right and and it's always been the assumptions that that the cops have right so so growing up uh my mom my mom always taught me to not trust authority uh even even in mexico it was always the cops there the cops everywhere are trash so it's it's to not trust authority to to be careful and, and every time I left my house, even though I was a badass kid, it was always like, you know, just watch yourself. Uh, so growing up, it was it was an extra an extra layer, I guess, of violence, right? Because the streets are violent, but then the people that are supposed to be protecting you are violent towards you. So there there really is nowhere to run. And and for the youth uh, that that I got to deal with that even to this day, it's it's sad. When when it happened, I was already a grown up, and and I remember uh, I was involved uh, in in uh, with an organization uh, that that dealt with more with immigrant rights than 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 anything else. So I think it was pretty sad that that even a lot of organizations uh, they they either didn't show up or or they wanted to distance themselves from from the situation, right? Because because even like local organizations and local politicians uh a lot of them you know they they wanted to calm things down and and do things the right way or whatever that is right so so it was more trying to silence the youngsters and and trying to guide them and and the youngsters don't care for that because first of all how are they going to trust you if they don't see you around to actually care about them right and and if the youngsters feel like nobody cares about them they have they don't have to listen to anyone right so, so I was there for for most of the nights when when it was really it got really ugly. Uh, and the the Tuesday night, I believe, when 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 everybody was in downtown, uh, at one point we were shot at with uh, with pepper balls or whatever it is. I mean, I didn't get hit, so I can't tell you what it was. But but for we're just standing there, right? And and for yelling at them because. 
And I remember that night, uh, one one of the kids that, that was there, if I'm not mistaken, he was just riding his bike home. And, and when we approached him, uh, one of my nephews was there with me. Well, two of my nephews was there with me. And 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 one that one kid, he was riding his bike and he was bleeding from the head because he had just he had just gotten shot by a projectile. So here we are protesting police brutality and the police are still acting brutally to to the youngsters, right? So so when they ask for respect or whatever they ask for, they can't really expect any respect or any or any type of civility when when the minute you you rebel, even as peaceful as you can. I mean, they still shoot at you, you know. So, so my heart still goes out to the families, obviously, and 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 my heart goes out to the kids that that have to grow up with that, and because it it doesn't seem that like 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 there's any any uh, chance for for change, at least not on their behalf, obviously, you know. So, uh, again, I, I may not organize anymore for various reasons, but I mean, I'm always willing to do what I can, and and. And if it's through the writing, then at least to to acknowledge the, the the history, right, of the city and the resistance, then that's what I'm gonna keep doing. And and it's sad, like like Maritza was saying, you know, it's sad that a lot of people don't know. And and the times when I have brought it up, when when I have done readings, and I ask them, like, you know, does anybody know what happened in Anaheim in 2012? And and when I see blank faces, it's it's, it's truly sad. It, it's either swept under the rug or, or it's just people that you know they just don't know yeah yeah and i think you know a, a, you know purpose of this kind of panel and just these um you know things that 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 i want to continue to do is is to still keep that you know that history of living and um you know because again i think if we forget about it there's these right there's, there's all these consequences that can happen um uh, but I think uh, I think we at an hour -ish, so um, you know definitely keep uh, you know you know hopefully another book drops by Jesus uh, and then look out for for the um, the volume two and and the submissions that are gonna come out of that um, and I want to thank uh, everyone at Museo and Grand Central um, I think Jennifer's still on here Jennifer Frias who organize the show um, uh, through the Begovich Gallery at CSUF, my alma mater. Uh, and I think, yeah, I want to thank everyone here, Jesus and, and Maritza and Katie and uh, folks uh, watching. And, and uh, you know, we, we want to continue to uh, push this programming and, and continue to, uh, you know, do uh, community, more, more community engagement as well. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, keep an eye out on uh, the website and, and just on, you know, on my personal Instagram and, and others as well, Muzel's Instagram as well. You can still see the show it is up until the 31st. And I think at Muzel, it's going to be up a little longer, right? January 4th. Yeah, yeah. until January 4th. You have until the 4th to check it out. Um, it, you know, it's, it's viewable from the outside, right? So uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, especially with COVID as well, uh, but trying to make it more accessible as well to the community. Any last yeah, and I, um, I just want to wrap it up really quickly by thanking our panelists, all of whom are inspiring and amazing the work that you're doing um, and the art that you're creating. And also to thank everyone for, you know, especially our pan panelists for being so authentic and courageous. And, you know, um, Museo is a public museum, right? We are funded in part by the city of Anaheim. And the fact that we are here to open up this programming and to show you that like Museo is, an, is a nonprofit organization, is a museum that is dedicated to its community. And um, we are willing to create space to have these conversations because we truly believe in the possibilities of the future. And, you know, we have to start from that authentic place of what the real experience is. And so, you know, sometimes, sometimes that can be so brutal and, um, and really hard. And uh, so, you know, it is new for us to be creating space like this. And so thank you for participating and for your courage and for just being a part of um, what we're trying to do here at Museo. And of course, William, thank you for always introducing us to the most amazing people in the community. So, um, 
yeah, I guess with so much gratitude, we will sign off for this evening and please keep in touch over Instagram is our kind of primary method of engagement right now. Uh, I'm working on our website. We'll get there. Uh, but please, Instagram is a really uh, good way to keep in touch with us. And we want to hear from our community. We want to hear what you want to see. We want to put your up. We want to put your art up on our walls, up in our digital spaces, you know, everywhere we possibly can. So um, any ideas you have, please know that Museo is an open space for you. And thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. <laughs>